Thank you. Um, so first, I want to start off by saying uh, it's really an honor to, to be here at this conference and, and uh, talk about this project that we have going on in Washington State. And, and um, a lot of you are kind of my idols. I was on my way to the, the conference thinking, man, we should have baseball cards for some of the folks that are going to be here. And <laughs> kind of looking at the stats and the publications that are coming out and some of the data to helping to implement some of these projects. Um, some of the, the projects that we really rely on for actually getting stuff done on the ground. Um, so, like, as mentioned, my name is Eric Hagan. Um, I most recently uh, relocated to Pennsylvania, so now I'm a graduate researcher at Penn State University, um, also with the USDA Agriculture Research Service at Penn State, uh, doing riparian conservation planning. Um, previous to that, I was in South Puget Sound, um, so I'll show that on the map in a second. Uh, so the, the wet side of Washington, not the dry wheat production side, but the west side, the temperate rainforest area. Um, where I was farming, I uh, had a, a highly diversified uh, vegetable, fruit, and livestock CSA um, on 36 acres, and at the same time was working with WSU Extension, Washington State University Extension, and uh, Mason Conservation District, uh, coordinating a small farms program there. So I was doing a lot of a lot of small scale um, e uh, small scale farming education, sustainable ag education and outreach, but also doing a lot of BMP implementation and working on water quality issues in the Puget Sound. So the project I'm presenting on is, uh, is the Working Buffers Feasibility Study that we started last summer. Um, I'll kind of go quickly over some of the issues in uh, the Puget Sound area, uh, give a little bit of background, then I'll talk about the project. Um, and yeah, so this was, so here we are in Puget Sound. Um, Puget Sound watershed spans approximately nine, or spans nine counties and it has 16 sub watershed. It's a pretty substantial drainage area in, in uh, Washington State. And it's also an area that hasn't had a lot of uh, colonial interaction in terms of age like we have seen in, in the rest of the states. Um, settlement didn't happen here until about 150 years ago. Um, prior to that, natives have thrived here for thousands of years. Um, so the impact on land management is relatively young compared to other areas in the region. So it's, that's pretty exciting as we start getting into natural resource conservation. We still have a lot of um, uh, wildlife species and, and, and um, uh, floral species still present from pre-settlement impacts. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the upper right, how do you do that pointer? Um, here's the Puget Sound. I was located down here in Olympia. Um, and this project here is looking to address the issue all around the Puget Sound, but you'll notice much of it focuses on the northern area. The, the northern, the uh, Whatcom, Skagit, and Snohomish counties are our staple agricultural valleys in western Washington state. As you can see from these other images here, this is Skagit Valley. Um, we're kind of confined geographically by the, the Cascades and the Puget Sound. Um, and then to couple that, we have intense um, urban urbanization moving into the area. Actually, western Washington between um, north Seattle down to Olympia is the urban corridor of Washington state. It's the highest um, uh, density of urbanization and, and population in the state. And so in terms of farmland, which Washington, Western Washington State was the bedrock of agriculture for, for many years. It's got a strong agricultural history, but due to those kind of pressure, those environmental pressures, um, again, Washington State is, is also a geo geologically very young area, so it's a very dynamic um, area. A lot of uh, regular floods, um, volcanic activity, just a lot of, of activity in the area that, that create a lot of natural land management. A, a little bit more challenging, um, not to mention with the, the urban corridor moving in. So farming in the area has kind of retreated over the last uh, 20, 30 years while most of that production went to the east side. So here we have an opportunity where we have a lot of natural resource value and a lot of farmland that's kind of on the verge of economic viability mixed with pressures from urbanization. So this project where we're looking at um, how conservation uh, perspective influences farmland preservation, um, and then on the other side of the coin, how development influences farmland preservation, really puts us at a place where agroforestry does have a great opportunity here, where we can enhance agricultural viability while meeting the conservation value and maintaining um, ag land and production. So in Puget Sound watershed, um, there are eight um, salmonid species. That's kind of the focus of the talk a little bit. 
uh, six of which are listed under, under the Federal Endangered Species Act. So that's, we ha obviously have a really substantial issue here with some very high priority fish species. These are, as many of you know, you probably, probably have eaten a lot of Pacific salmon. It's way better than Atlantic salmon. Even though I'm an East Coaster now, I'm going to admit. Um, so we really do want to preserve this natural resource. Not to mention that this is a very significant cultural um, uh, resource to the, to the tribal nations in the region and also currently to our economic viability. Um, but also to, the, to the, what the salmon do in terms of bringing in fertility and resources into the whole regional ecology. The, the, they say 80% of uh, fertility in, in um, the Puget Sound region's uh, forests actually come from salmon migration. So as, so as we kind of look at large scale regional management, forest land management, farmland preservation, farmland uh, soil health and all this, it kind of starts with how our fertility and, and our ecology is mi moving in biogeochemically fertility into the region and, and managing climate in that way as well. Um, also in the region is a, is a multi-billion dollar international market of shellfish production. We are the world's producer of gooey duck, this very, very substantial um, clam. I don't know if any of you have ever heard or had gooey duck. It's the best clam in the world, but as you could tell, it looks a little silly. I can hear a lot of middle school jokes happening right now in your heads. Um, and, but we really high value. Uh, each gooey duck goes for retail about twenty to thirty dollars um, per gooey duck. Um, you can produce millions of them on an, or th tens of thousands of them on an acre. Um, also, really uh, well known for native and Japanese oysters, as well as clams and Dungeness uh, crab. And again, cultural significance, but also a major economic significance for the region. Besides timber um, and tourism. This is, and obviously Boeing, um, this is our major economic, ben economic um, interest in the Puget Sound area. So when it comes to this interaction of upland farming and tide tideland farming, upland farming obviously isn't as lucrative, at least anymore, um, as uh, tideland farming. So at the policy level, tideland farming gets a lot of sway in terms of negotiating terms and requirements for upland pollution management. So in, in Puget Sound, we're a little different um, than in terms of thinking about uh, the Chesapeake Bay, um, where we're not really as focused on nitrogen and phosphorus issues. We're really focused here on fecal coliform. This comes from septic tanks, uh, urbanization, but also livestock operations and manure applications for row cropping. Um, and this is largely um, impacting shellfish harvest. Again, this multi-billion dollar industry has had, there's a tremendous amount of tidelands that could be put into production but can't be because of Department of Health has closed these beaches to harvesting due to high counts of fecal coliform, which as many of you likely know, uh, poses a tremendous health risk on anyone that consumes fecal coliform. Um, another big water quality issue in our region is stream temperature. The salmon re rely on really cool water for, um, for migration, for also targeting their home breeding grounds and then also breeding and rearing of their, of their juvenile. So stream temperature is important and, and in many of the agricultural areas, um, buffers have been removed as with most across the nation. Um, therefore stream temperatures rise in those early headwaters which then increase temperatures on, on larger fish bearing streams which poses a, a tremendous risk for not only uh, stream temperature habitat but also increasing in algal blooms and those sorts of things happening in the, within the Puget Sound. And also habitat. This is concurrent with stream temperature. Habitat and stream temperature really come from shading and forested riparian buffer. Habitat here is typically in-stream um, debris, large woody debris, um, and gravel bars uh, and things like that, that that salmon require for their breeding. Um, so these are kind of the three major concerns that we're looking at when we address water quality. So, Again, going back to the, the, poli the politics of it all, I'm not going to touch too much into that, but um, because we are so focused on uh, all those, those uh, fecal coliform stream temp and, um, and habitat, we're really looking at substantial forested buffers. There's a lot of pressure from the tribal nations, from environmental agencies, the EPA Clean Water Act, um, Department of Ecology and these environmental regulatory groups to increase riparian buffer requirements on all agricultural landscapes. Um, 
This increase comes in the form of recommendations from the National Marine Fishery Service. It's a program of NOAA. Um, and they put out this buffer recommendations table, which has, in my time in Washington State, has been probably one of the more um, controversial conversations I've heard on on in the agriculture industry um, since I've been there. Um, currently, oops, sorry, there's animations in this. So currently, we're looking at um, NRCS, Department of Ecology, and all these other cost share funding source for implementing for assisting landowners in implementing riparian buffers. Um, a minimum of 35 foot forested buffer must be must, must be um, put in place, especially along fish bearing creeks. That's relatively reasonable. It, it doesn't take a whole lot of ag land out of production, but farm, uh, landowners are still having a, a kind of a bitter taste in their mouth when they consider that. But if you look at 2016, NRCS was requiring 50 foot. Um, while Department of Ecology funds, which really comes from the Environmental Protection Agency, are already requiring 50 foot minimum and are now already looking at 75 foot minimum. So when we go back to, that's annoying, uh, when we go back to these uh, NIMS buffers, the National Marine Fisheries Service buffers, we're starting to look at up to 180 foot in the near future. Every year the conversation is growing for, there, there's um, uh, policy looking to increase these buffer widths every year for achieving cost share funding. So right now is a big scramble to get landowners to put in the 35 foot buffer so they're safe, they're in the program, they're not, next year they're not gonna have to put in a 50 foot. But in future years, if you come under environmental um, enforcement, so if you have been shown to pollute waters off your property, or, or if you wanted to say get a lagoon or a, a manure storage structure, you have to first put in a buffer. So can you see the challenge here where if you want something done, if you want to do the right thing, right now you got to put in a 35 foot buffer. By next year, you're already looking at a 50 foot buffer. The conversation is by the third year, we're looking at 75 to 100 foot buffer. Every year we're looking at tying up more and more ground. And in that earlier picture that you saw, that saw the, the Skagit Valley, that's unusual to have that large of a landscape in agricultural production. Most of these are little pocket valleys, usually about 40 to 60 acres. And it, you can imagine what a drainage ditch running through a 40 acre field does with 70 foot buffer or, or 35 foot buffer on either side of it's gonna do to agricultural production. Really, really limits the potential. Um, th I did an assessment in Mason County, which is a very small agricultural uh, producing region in the west side of Puget Sound. Um, a, a, 50 foot buffer would remove 20% of ag for the whole county. So if we start looking at even increasing the buffer beyond that, it's kind of an exponential decrease in, in, in agricultural productivity. So again, increasing pressures from the policy and lobbying. Um, the other challenge with this conversation is that currently in place in Washington State is a no touch buffer protocol. So these forested buffers that are implemented are now protected by the state and must maintain forested buffer. There can be no harvest of timber. Um, you know, obviously understory, but looking at mushrooms and that sort of thing, the conversation hasn't really gone that far, but maintaining a closed canopy is, is priority for these buffer systems. This kind of came out of a, the, fish, the Forest and Fish Report in 1999, which is a consortium of state and federal agencies that got together to to put together recommendations and, and protocols for forest timberland management. So how, timber, how forested timberlands affect stream and water quality is what provided these recommendations. That same year, Washington State adopted the Salmon Recovery Act of 1999, which looked at how we can enhance and preserve salmon habitat throughout the whole state. And then in 2006, the Washington State Forest Practices Habitat Conservation Plan put into pl place all of the recommendation in the forest and fish report. This, this is, is also known as the Forest and Fish Act of 2006. And so what that did was on all stream systems in Western Washington and in Washington State, uh, they have to meet the guidelines of the timber industry practices along stream buffers. So what we're arguing here is that this is an agricultural landscape, not a forested landscape. If we were, if we were, you know, if in an agricultural landscape, you have a high disturbance regime that are implementing a forested buffer, and it's a completely different scenario than a forested landscape where you're talking about setbacks for how close you can harvest to the stream. 
So obviously we face a lot of challenges. Um, in 2014, American Farmland Trust and Snohomish Conservation District did a uh, survey within Snohomish County to address, um, I need to start moving really fast here, um, to, to try to find ways to implement uh, forested riparian buffers in the region, looking at the barriers for why landowners are not chomping at the bit to, to gain federal dollars to conserve landscapes along the riparian, riparian corridor. 92% actually said they would be willing to implement the riparian buffer, but 78% said they, they preferred to retain the use of the buffer. And as we get into this table here, if you look at the, the 35-foot, there was more people interested in a 35-foot buffer, but 47% said no to a 100-foot buffer. So here's this conversation where 35-foot buffer is already, 35 is already a bit much for, for farmers to consider pulling out of production. Then you start looking at the, the argument of 100-foot buffer, then you're way, way off the, the, the charts in terms of um, adoptability. So what we did was start talking about how can we actually engage these landowners? Like what are, what are other methods for engaging landowners to implement riparian buffers but also still maintain the use? Well, voila, we're all here at a great agroforestry conference and that's what we're trying to consider. So what we did was develop the Working Buffer Feasibility Study. Um, key project partners here are the Snohomish Conservation District, WSU Extension, and Mason Conservation District, um, as well as NOAA, and it was um, funded in partnership with uh, the Puget Sound Partnership. The reason why I bring this up in advance is because it, it was a really amazing partnership to have WSU Extension, which is focused on agricultural production. Um, we also had a, uh, a non-timber specialty forest product specialist um, present on this project as well. But also, we were working directly with NOAA. We were working directly with the representative from, from um, the Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Program. He was a specialist for Puget Sound Recovery, and he was si he's sitting at the head of these tables having this conversation, engaging policymakers on this uh, no-touch or to-manage buffer um, conversation. So what we're suggesting is looking at CREP lands um, and allowing for management within them, actually engaging the conversation with NRCS to see if there's ways to maintain CREP past contract, or even consider incentivizing landowners to put CREP into, into contract by allowing them some potential management. Um, Reclassify reca riparian forest buffers um, as agricultural forested buffers so that they could be seen as an agricultural product as opposed to uh, timberland forest setback. Um, and also look at finding ways to provide cost share funding to set up these buffers. Um, but really what we're trying to get at is allow flexibility in buffer, in buffer design. So we're really tackling here this no-touch buffer concept. Um, the, 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 the idea that a buffer, when implemented, should be, not be managed is, is a little challenging for us to grasp when a lot of the buffers are like when we implement. So you can see all the resources here that have gone into establishing this buffer. They're, they laid down straw, they laid down wood chip, they're spraying glyphosate, um, there are herbicide applications, weed whackers. We, ha we hire uh, a tremendous amount of students through Washington Conservation Corps to go out there every summer to weed whack acres upon acres upon acres of these riparian buffers. That's management. That's not very much different than agricultural management. So if we engage in that conversation and we, and we look at providing data and resources for what agroforestry can do, especially in these early successional stages of riparian buffer, then can we engage policymakers to allow landowners when they put these these areas out of agricultural production or into forested riparian buffer can they still maintain this as say silver pasture or alley cropping can they still maintain some sort of agricultural cropping system in these areas so the challenge here is phase buffer width is very easy very easy for regulators to enforce um, but what we're trying to recommend is flexible width buffers is very easy for us to actually implement more riparian buffers. We can engage conversation with landowners saying, hey, that wet spot over there is really challenging for you to cut hay, but you know what? We could put it in willow and we can do maybe short crop rotation um, or, or any other sort of uh, practice that would be most beneficial to that area. Um, but really what we're looking at doing is Working in tandem with landowners, what do landowners want? They obviously want economic potential. They want economic gain. They want to they be able to maintain the use of their landscape. That's what private land ownership is about. But we also have a tremendous amount of resources in the natural resource technician industry, professional industry, 
where we have a lot of, uh, of data, we have a lot of GIS application tools, we have all this information to really do help landowners do some really site-specific design and help them to create positive outcomes, both agri agriculturally but also on the conservation end. So what we did for this project is we did an extensive, li extensive literature review and put together a white paper to actually d reach out and describe to policymakers and landowners what this, what this program is about. We developed four design templates which, um, which went over uh, the, the various strategies um, of forest farming. What does far forest farming look like? What are the benefits to a landowner? What are the benefits to conservation programming? Um, how do you design and implement forest farming? What would this look like on the landscape? What could it best be used for? Um, and then how do you actually achieve cost share? Are there cost share dollars out at NRCS right now for forest farming, multi-story cropping? Yes, there is. So essentially what we were doing was, one, putting together an outreach material for landowners saying, hey, look at all these really great practices that you could do on your landscape. You can diversify your, your upland sources, you can diversify your riparian corridor, you can, agroforestry is a really great thing. But at the same time, we're bringing this to the policy makers and saying, hey, here, here's an interesting conversation. This is the best available science out there right now. That this, maybe that this is a possibility for us. It might be a little bit idealistic. We might need to explore a lot of potential markets out there. There's a lot of work that still needs to go into this, but let's consider this, this management piece and how landowners can actually engage in stewarding our, na our regionals, region's natural resources. Um, so what we did is we came up with a two-part buffer system. We got the, the riparian buffer zone. This is really to appease the policymakers. Um, but what we're looking at here is this channel migration zone. What is the potential for the channel to jump ship, move out to the, to the landscape? Those areas are critical for preservation, critical for salmon habitat, critical for infrastructure and you know, taxpayer dollar cost share funds to, to protect. We don't want to put uh, a lot of funding in an area that we know is going to wash out in the next big flood which will happen this year again. Um, and then we, we came up with the, the working buffer zone. So this is a little different than that three zone that the Forest Service put out. This one here is, just starts to look at, okay, we have these concentrated flow areas where we might need to have a larger riparian buffer or a wider area because of channel migration, but we can get a little closer to the stream here if we're looking at treating some of that concentrated flow. If we're looking at these tile drain systems and saturated buffers, or if we're looking at creating constructed wetlands and, and planting them to short rotation coppicing systems uh, for biomass production. Um, so we came up with kind of all the, this kind of blanket scenario of anything from a 35 foot or 15, even a 15 foot conversation of a no touch na native only buffer that would provide the stream and habitat function for salmon habitat and then pushing all the way out as far upland as the landowner wants to go, depending on site conditions. What we've also been doing, and I'll talk really quickly on this, is kind of starting to assess the landscape, um, the whole regional landscape for what are the soil types and, and what are the agricultural parcels that, that are um, areas of concern? What are the types of soils that have the highest possibility of, of uh, surface water runoff, um, fecal coliform transport, um, and, and those agricultural parcels that are closest proximity to unbuffered streams? With this kind of catalog, then we can start really targeting these, the, this approach of agroforestry applications and even really start to assessing what are the trade-offs of applying agro agroforestry into a general landscape and what is this going to do you know, 50, 100 years from now in terms of recovering Puget Sound efforts in agricultural landscape. Does this even make sense? Does adding this much forested buffers really make sense to meet our goals? Um, so what we're doing right now, so we got the, the lit review, the white paper's out, conversation going on at the, the policy level. What we're doing right now is looking at, looking at demonstration projects and looking at doing some site-specific design work. Um, this is graciously funded by a number of, of agencies out there that already have programs in place to fund uh, agroforestry practices in Washington State and in many other states in the area. Um, it's just a matter of training those, those conservation district or NRCS technicians to actually know that those resources are available. That's what I ran into here in Washington State where I came in with this idealist, idealistic perspective as a permaculturist, as a farmer, and I got a cool idea and then I kept running into this, what are you talking about? So I just started pulling out the, the papers, the BMP uh, standards saying multi-story cropping, hedgerow planting, silvopasture, it's all there in your protocol, it's already approved for the, the state, and we started bringing in funding. And, just by putting in the conservation plans. They started funding it. 
they started opening up their opening up the conversation. So obviously you guys know that I'm really going to move faster I'm out of time but um, this makes a lot of sense to farmers for many reasons it makes a lot of sense to natural resource uh, conservation particularly because we're getting the wider buffers that the tribes and the EPA and the other regulatory agencies are asking for but we're engaging the landowners to participate in that stewardship we don't want to keep removing landowners from you know if we, if we have a black and white you, this is ag this is conservation you can't touch this you can do whatever you want over here that's just going to creep, keep creating this divide of conservation and ag but if you start looking if we can start engaging this this conversation even at the policy level that those two can be integrated what we're going to do is create what again my idealistic big picture thinking here what we could potentially do is engage a culture of farmers to recognize their off farm impacts and 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 economically viable ways that they can help remediate that even just start paying attention to areas on their farm that they could be losing fertilizer or pesticide inputs or even uh, money down the drain and down these concentrated flow paths that um, that we can look to tie up with different strategies and this is just one of many different strategies so to go through because I'm out of time what we need is obviously more data everybody needs to do more research that was a joke. <laughs> but we could really use that, especially on you know, impacts of silvopasture in this th sort of climate. Um, there's a lot of research here in the Midwest, but what does this look like in the, in the Northwest? And what does it look like in the Northeast? Um, alley cropping, all these different practices are the big gaping holes in data across the nation, um, especially for site-specific design. Um, and I encourage all of you to, to keep you know, in your area, keep putting pressure on NRCS. Right now, the EPA Clean Water Act is putting pressure on NRCS at a national level to increase their buffer requirements. Um, and I highly encourage you to increase back pressure on that, but also can have them consider that their, their programs actually take into consideration the possibility of management within their, within their systems. And then, quite, then ask them what is their retention rate for, the, for their contracts that they're putting in due to market fluctuations and if and and if a managed buffer could actually aid in maintaining CREP contracts longer than the 15-year program there was more but I talked too much are there any questions <laughs> yeah hey, you mentioned you had some templates yes for kinds of productive buffers yes can you describe some of them and do you have some economic well, I can't say data, but estimations. Yes. Know, profitable. Yes. So I breezed over that really quickly. Um, so the templates that we put together were were the big um, outreach materials. Um, so what they involved primarily was again, like I said, how do you design, implement, and manage these systems? What do they look like on the landscape? Um, presented on each one was a kind of a top selection of all the the. Um, woody cropping um, species that are known to do well in the region actually known to survive actually known to produce um, that a, you know a landowner can choose from what we're trying to specifically do here and this kind of gets at the marketing piece is we're, we're specifically not trying to promote a certain marketable cropping system this was done seven years ago in the Skagit Valley where everyone said you know we could do a working buffers on all ag ditches everyone should plant poplars well, everyone went out and planted poplars while the pulp industry tanked those poplars are still standing looking like this, dead in the understory. There's nothing happening there. That was 30 years ago. Um, so we don't want to run into that. So what we did was we just put examples. You know, here are three cropping examples, that, and here are the economics, here are the, the potential production opportunities in, given this climate in this region, the, the amount yield, the potential gain per acre. Um, but with a large disclaimer on all of it saying this is due to market fluctuations and we're not trying to get everybody to go out and plant cider apples. There's only so many cideries that can handle that. You know, don't go out and plant willow because we're still working on the biorefinery process. Um, I just, so, I was just expecting that being that close to whether in these urban areas, yeah. in the Seattle metro area, yeah. that there would be a real market for rich products. There really is, and it's it's really vastly unexplored. And I and you know what we're really looking for are those early adopters. And what I found is those early adopters were the folks that are getting ready to retire and just looking for a hobby. 
They have maybe 40 acres. They maybe run 10, 20 head of cattle just for fun, just to feed their family. They're not serious commercial producers, but they have 30 or 40 acres that they're willing to put 10 acres in, into chestnuts just to see what happens. You it's know? Interesting to me. My, yep. my nephew is one of those farmers in the Skagit Valley. Oh, awesome. He's, he's trying to do some alternative agriculture. Great. Yeah, yeah. There's a number of them out, uh, of them moving into the area. A lot of young farmers coming in, as well. A lot of highly diversified farms starting to in, put in uh, alley cropping into their vegetable CSA operations. Um, you know, really starting to. You know, one thing that we really hone in on um, is the succession process. You know, you start with an annual cropping disturbance species. You know, how can you slowly make your way to? Uh, in a, more of an established long-term canopy cropping system while still maintaining the economic viability of vegetables along the way and kind of presenting alley cropping and, or silvopasture as this tool for reestablishing the forested landscape, especially in these high priority floodplain areas. But going about it this really, you can still maintain your agricultural, you know, your cultivation, your tillage, whatever you want to do. What do you think about planting rows? You know. All right, let's thank Eric and let him